Going inside the issues of our community, this is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. In December, the Cincinnati City Council struggled to produce a balanced budget. The crunch came over funding the $4.7 million that the city traditionally used to support nearly 70 social service agencies. The mayor and city manager proposed eliminating that category altogether, but council balked. The compromise solution was to restore $2 million of that funding by using the revenue generated by traffic lights synced to cameras like these in Dayton, Ohio. The cameras automatically issue tickets to drivers who run red lights. Last week, Ohio Representative James Rawson of Springdale introduced legislation to prevent Ohio cities from using these devices. To discuss this challenge uh, to the city's use of cameras and to the city's right under home rule, I am joined this morning by James Rawson, who is serving his second term in the Ohio House of Representatives, and David Pepper, a member of Cincinnati City Council and chair of the Law and Public Safety Committee. Welcome back to Newsmakers for both of you. Jim, why have you moved to take this tool away from cities in Ohio? Uh, Dan, over the past few weeks, we've seen what I call camera fever been hitting Ohio. A number of municipalities, uh, large cities, including Cincinnati, have looked at putting cameras in. And when we started peeling the onion and receiving calls from individuals in Cincinnati, in Hamilton County, and across the state of Ohio, we found out that there were some serious flaws in the camera system. Uh, two reports recently, one coming out uh, in January of this year, one coming out in July of last year, both uh, funded by grant dollars, one by the U.S. Department of Transportation, showed that uh, not only do accidents not decrease when these cameras are installed, rear-end accidents increase. And Because if, people are stopping short, they don't want to run that red light? There's a fear factor. People lose their driver instinct. They see the, the lights changing. They slam on their brakes, and rear-end collisions inc uh, uh, increase. And if safety is the issue, this is not the way to go based upon current data. What do you say about, about that, David? I want to take a step back, and I actually don't, e don't agree with the, the way this was even presented uh, in That's terms fine. of just a budget issue. This was approved as a concept before the budget. Big picture, Cincinnati has a crime problem, major crime happening throughout our city, violent crime. The reason I support looking into these cameras and technology is because we only have 1,075 officers in our city. We need them as much as possible in crime hotspots and crime locations. And if you stop and think about the amount of time it takes for any one officer to do one of these red light pullovers or, or a speeding pullover, that's 30, 40, 50 minutes off the street each time. I think our citizens of Cincinnati, and this is why I think the state shouldn't get involved, they want to see our officers maximize as much as possible, get them in the violent crime areas, being visible, being able to respond to violent crime. And our city is smartly trying to use technology as one way to do that, to enhance our manpower on the street. And I, I honestly think this is not just about traffic safety, and I, I don't agree with those studies. I think it helps traffic safety. It's much bigger than that. It's about safety and prevention of violent crime and using our officers in the way that our city and our citizens want them to use, which is out on the street, out of their cars, out from behind the desk, okay. and particularly in crime areas. Okay, I want to come back to the effectiveness question in a minute because you both have alluded to it or talked about it. But, Jim, what about that, that this just allows a better use of police officers? Well, first of all, we, it makes it sound like red light, running through red lights is an epidemic running rampant across the state of Ohio and that officers aren't able to respond to violent crime scenes because they're busy issuing tickets to people violating red lights. And that's simply not the case. We don't see across the state uh, red light epidemics and these devices have been around for now 15 years and the only reason we're seeing them being issued now in the state of Ohio is because some of the larger cities are having tough budget crunches and they're using these as part of their revenue stream. And when you see large cities like Cincinnati and Cleveland putting in this their operating budget, we can see that it's not for basically safety. They're looking at it as a revenue stream. I, I, let, me, I, let me interrupt. I do not need to have anyone tell me what my, I'm the head of the Law and Public Safety Committee. Crime is our number one issue. We all know that. We have 13 officers per square mile in this city. That's one of the lowest in the country, and we have to push in every way possible to increase our manpower on the street. We've added officers. It's a tough budget time. Uh, we can't just keep adding officers. We, we should try, but it's hard to do. 
to maximize our street presence, we should look at technologies. This was something that came up months ago from the administration, and we supported doing an RFP then. Now it came up again during the budget. But you know, safety, 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 preventing violent crime, the, the key part of it, as every citizen will tell you, is do we see enough officers on the street? And the answer is, in Cincinnati right now, no, we don't. We but don't see them on the street. We don't see them in, in, in the high crime areas. This is one way that allows us to do that. If Mr. Rawson doesn't want that for the area he represents, that's fine. We had a 6-3, a healthy debate at City Council about this. We decided this is one way we okay. can deploy officers better, and I think we need to do Let's it. Let's approach the effectiveness question. Um, I've got some statistics that I found from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. introduced an automated red light enforcement program in August 1999. They have 39 camera locations. The D.C. police have tracked a 71% decline in violations at these sites, accounting for 26,800 fewer violations per month. Over that four and a half year period, the district has collected $29.3 million in fines from tickets issued by the cameras. Now, I did a you know, Google search and found lots of different things. I, I have to say I did not read the studies that, that you cited, but those were pretty dramatic figures, both in terms of safety, but also in terms of budget. I mean, both things going together. You're, you're, what about that? I mean, those, well, here's are, those the are real numbers. Here's the problem, Dan, that what your statistics don't show. And the fact is, is that what happens is you're ticketing the driver. Uh, you're supposed to be ticketing the driver, but what happens is you're ticketing, ticketing the owner of the vehicle. What just came out this week from the Washington Post was a writer of the Washington Post received the ticket in his mailbox. However, he was 3,000 miles away doing a story in the Middle East when he received a ticket. He had borrowed his car, led his car vehicle to someone, to a group of people who was remodeling his home. He didn't know who the driver was, and the city of D.C. said, hey, either you tell us who is driving your vehicle or you pay the, t the ticket. And since he couldn't conclusively mm -hmm. swear on a Bible of who the driver was, he had to pay the ticket. So that's a, there's an inherent well, flaw in that. Plus, let me, let me finish by saying that what we see time and time again is if we're really looking at safety, you aren't issued points on your license when you go through these civil tickets. So in other words, if Dan Hurley goes through a red light camera, he gets a ticket but no points. If Jim Rawson goes through a red light and is caught by an officer, Jim Rawson gets points. There's a due process and equal protection argument there, and that's why a number of cities across the country, judges have thrown these things out by the volumes. Okay, let's, what Let about that? Because this was an argument back these when These arguments you were made this. at city council, and if Mr. Rawson wants to come to Cincinnati City Council and, and join our body and debate them, that's just fine. It was a 6-3 vote the other way. And again, this is a basic issue of how does the city of Cincinnati deploy its police officers? That's the safety issue. That's the overarching issue. And for the state to start getting into the most well, local of local issues, which is deployment of your police officers well, to maximize safety. Well, I, let, let me respond really to that, I have losing, to respond to that because that is <laughs> way off base. The state does play a role in traffic enforcement. We're the primary authority of traffic laws for Ohio. This is the state of Ohio, our state government. Give you a great example. In Ohio, unlike Kentucky or Indiana, if you get caught for a moving violation, you must be caught by an officer in clothes, in not undercover, no unmarked. Why? Because it's a state law. The city of Cincinnati can't pull you over, uh, the county can't pull you over, or the highway patrol can't pull you over unless they're in a marked vehicle. That's a state law. So we do have enforcement authority, and it is a primary but, reason why we have to have uniformity in the state. Jim, let me stop you, though, on, on another thing, just on sort of a larger philosophical approach, which I, David was, was raising here. Cincinnati does have home rule, as do most medium and large-sized cities have home rule, which means they have the ability uh, a, fair, a fairly large latitude in about how to, uh, uh, to rule, how to work within that city. Isn't this sort of a violation of not only the, the technicalities, but the spirit of home rule? Well, Dan, it's always good to do your homework before you introduce legislation. That's exactly what we did. We, put, we introduced our bill and, and sent it through the Legislative Service Commission asking that very question. And based upon the parameters and the example that I gave you, there are cases in which the state has oversight on traffic law. I mean, there's got to be uniformity. I mean, you can't go to Cincinnati and expect 
uh, for their red light system to be different than when you travel to the city of Dayton. There needs to be uniformity for Ohio but citizens why, when why they did travel. You, why did you introduce this now? Why not introduce it? I mean, there are a number of other cities, including Dayton, which we had the video from, that have been using this for a number of years. Why introduce this now? We have an impact because it's going to be across the state here very shortly. I'd like to get this debate more public and more across Ohio before they're installed in Cincinnati, before they're installed in Cleveland, before they're installed in Columbus, and that's why I think it's important to have this debate right now. David, what about the home rule question and the rights of Cincinnati versus the I, state? I haven't looked in the legality of it. I just go back to the same point. A, a city like Cincinnati needs to do everything we can do to maximize our police officers and make the city safer. This is one way to get there, especially when we know that we need more officers on the street rather than less. Okay. To, to, not, to have the state say, you can't even look to different technologies to do that, to, frankly, to me, is an outrage. Let, let me, well, let, said, well, first of all, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm defending civil rights here, and I thought typically, you know, the Cincinnati and, and the problems that it struggled with over the past couple of years and individual rights, they would be more receptive to that than most cities. So I'm shocked that the city let me of ask, Cincinnati let me of ask all the question, cities is trying to do let this. Let me ask the question this way. Does this ever, <laughs> Jim, did you just think about, well, maybe I he just need call. to call yeah. up the mayor who actually has a complex view on this right. off this particular situation, or David Pepper, or or any member of council, and say, we need to come, we need to sit down and talk about this. Because this is not just about the city of Cincinnati, Dan. Columbus, Cleveland, Springfield, Warren, Ohio, other cities across the state. It wasn't just a Cincinnati issue. I know a lot of times well, did they you think call it's up, a Cincinnati did you call issue, but it only came up if you places. saw the Cincinnati headlines on We it. talked to a number of individuals across the state, a number of mayors across the state, including people in the municipal league about this issue, and saying, why, why are the, they attaching this to revenue streams? And a number of citizens contacted us, and civil groups said, we think you, you, there needs to be a state debate on this topic. That's how we responded. Addressing David, the needs I just, of the I don't, constituents. I think, you know, the civil rights of our citizens right now are most directly impinged by the crime we're talking about. And I don't need the state legislature, majority suburbanites, telling us, you know, he, they're worried about the civil rights of speeders and red light traffic violators. I'm worried about the civil rights of people who are seeing this crime David, and want to see more officers. You just introduced something that talks about the sort of the dynamics behind this. Right. Is this suburban versus center city? Is this a... Is that really the issue here? I don't the, the yeah. political dynamic. I don't know if it's the politics, but I don't sense that a lot of folks in Columbus understand the pressure we have right now to maximize street strength of our officers and to have them say, you know, it, it, to, to have them say, well, this is just for revenue. This isn't about trying to maximize officers. I can tell you, we, we spend a lot of time okay. figuring out how to get these folks on the street. Dan, we have 25 co-sponsors on this bill, including Catherine Barrett, She's who's a Democrat. She is a member of, she represents the city of Cincinnati. Uh, we have, it's a bipartisan support. Urban people, suburban people are on this bill. It's an issue worth debating. Did, did you just say that Catherine, Catherine Barrett told me she's not on it. Well, she's never she's notified our office. Okay. There's, there's been no notification to us. Jim, where is this bill in process? I mean, it has been referred to the Transportation Committee, and it'll have hearings starting in the next couple of weeks. Okay. So there will be public hearings, and then it will depending on what happens there, be reported out to the floor and, and whatever, right? Right. And what does the city of Cincinnati do when something like this happens in Columbus that you oppose? What abilities do you have? Well, we, we work very hard to try and get our message out. We have a lobbyist up there. I think hopefully some of us can go up there. Uh, but, but I take this very seriously. Again, you know, I don't know what the crime, crime situation is in some of the suburban areas. But this critical question, especially as our local government fund is being threatened by the governor and the, and the legislature, cutting back on our ability to provide some of these basic safety services, to have this Columbus tell us that we can't explore ways to maximize street strength, uh, let we, me will, just, fight, let we me will continue to, this, to fight Let that. me just say this, Dan. First of all, we were never contacted by the city when we started looking into this issue. We were contacted by their lobbyists. Uh, the cities have a responsibility, too. It's a two-way communication street here. They're worried about the way they're operating. They have a duty and responsibility to contact us. Cities have thrown this out across the country. Uh, there's been due process arguments. Referendums have taken place. Traffic malfunctions with the cameras themselves. There's other engineering solutions that can be done 
rather than using these cameras. I have less than a minute left, so I want to ask a very practical question. Where are we in even the city installing any of these? This things? is the, the it mean, I have concerns, and we'll make sure we do it right. We, we, all we're wanting to do is an RFP process so we can take the different proposals from vendors, make sure that we pick one that has, you know, that, that deals with some of the different issues that come up. We have the same concerns. Have we I issued the RFPs? The RFPs out. It should come back in the next couple months. Uh, we're no dummies. I'm no dummy. I'm looking out for the same concerns. We can solve this at City Hall. We don't need Columbus, most of whom are, don't have the problems, uh, don't, don't represent areas with problems we have, telling us not to do it because they have these concerns. Okay. A good, practical, honest debate here. Thank you for being with Thanks. us this morning, and we'll follow this as it gets worked out because it's obviously not going to be done quickly. Stay tuned after the break. A special investigative report on county finance judicial travel, re re judicial travel to resorts. Welcome back. 2005 is shaping up as a grim year for employees of Hamilton County. The proposed budget has no raises for non-union employees. But for the past several years, some of the county's highest paid employees have been enjoying some pretty expensive trips as part of a continuing education program. Local 12 reporter Jeff Hirsch periodically prepares special reports for Local 12 newsmakers. This morning, Jeff looks at judges and their travels. Ah, nothing beats a family vacation getting together and jetting off to some luxurious destination. Places like, say, Key West, Florida, Carmel, California, or how about a golf resort in the Rocky Mountains of Montana? What? You say you've never been to Key West or Carmel or the Montana Rockies? That's okay. Your money's been there. That's right, a Local 12 investigation has found some Hamilton County judges are jetting around the country to posh resort towns on your tax dollar in the name of continuing legal education, even though those same judges can get continuing legal education here in Ohio, right here in Cincinnati, even in their own offices on the Internet. But instead, some judges are trading this for this. Welcome to the Grouse Mountain Lodge in Whitefish, Montana, at a conference sponsored by the American Academy of Judicial Education, an organization which puts on continuing education seminars for judges in resorts around the country. And here, at the judges' reception at Grouse Mountain Lodge in August, are Hamilton County Judges Robert C. Winkler and his brother, Judge Ralph E. Ted Winkler. The Winklers came here for a conference called Confession, Interrogation, and Suppression, scheduled from August 14th to August 20th, 2004. Robert's cost to the taxpayers, shown in this county expense form, $3,430 for tuition, air travel, food, and lodging. Brother Ralph's cost, $3,625. Judges in Ohio are required to take an average of 20 hours of continuing education each year. Enough courses are available in or near Cincinnati, some even online. But as long as the class is approved by the Ohio Supreme Court, you can take your course at, say, the Grouse Mountain Lodge in Whitefish, Montana, 2,062 miles from home. Now, we should point out that the classes in Whitefish do appear to be a fairly full day, 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, Sunday through Thursday, and 8 till 1 on Friday. But let's take a closer look at the schedule. There's classes on Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hey, where's Tuesday? And look at this. On Ralph Winkler's expense report on August 16th, two charges from the Montana Adventure Company, and on August 18th, another. The Grouse Mountain Lodge tells Local 12 those charges are for golf. Now, the Winklers did pay for the golf themselves, but you, the taxpayer, got them there, kept them there, and fed them there. 
You paid for the Winkler Brothers trip the year before, too, at the exact same Rocky Mountain Resort. County records show the two judges were once again at the Grouse Mountain Lodge in Whitefish, Montana, August 2003, for a class called a Judge's Philosophy of Law and Judging. Combined cost to the taxpayers for that trip, nearly $7,000. Now, we should point out that the Winklers did not go to Whitefish, Montana in 2002. However, county records indicate they did go somewhere else. Key West, Florida was Ralph Winkler's $3,100 destination for the judge's fact finder in March 2002. Watching the sun bake. Not to be outdone, Judge Robert Winkler checked out constitutional law and criminal procedure in... If everybody had a Carmel, California in August 2002 for nearly $3,500. Yes, the Winklers are a traveling family. Because joining Judge Robert Winkler in Carmel was his father, appeals court judge Ralph Winkler Sr. for another $3,200. Adding it all up, you the taxpayer paid nearly $24,000 for the Winkler's trips. That's nearly half the cost for all of the county's judges the past three years. Hi, hi, state your name. Ralph E. Winkler. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. It was a short trip, though, to the courthouse last month when Ralph Winkler Sr. swore in son Ted as Ted moved up from municipal court to common pleas. Brother Robert was there, too, along with many other judges for Ted's big day. And it is a historic day in Hamilton County to have one Winkler on the Court of Appeals, one Winkler on the Court of Common Pleas, and one Winkler on Municipal Court. The Winkler brothers refused on-camera interviews, but off-camera strongly defended the trips, said Ted. The public is served because I learned things I didn't learn in Ohio from top teachers. It makes me a better judge, so it's worth the taxpayer expense. The law is constantly evolving. And I'm not bragging. If you travel around, you'll notice that uh, we've got the best judges and the best lawyers down here in Hamilton County, state of Ohio. Winkler conceded he and his brother did play golf three times in Whitefish last year after classes were over and did go sightseeing on the off day, but got the cheapest rental car they could and were not extravagant. Brother Robert also said, it's not a vacation on county time. My wife won't even go with me. It does make me a better judge. Court policy usually limits judges to one out-of-town trip per year, but the majority of the county's 36 judges did not go out of town at all and certainly not several years in a row. Records obtained by Local 12 show the past three years, 13 judges taking a total of 24 trips outside the tri-state to conferences in resort areas in California, Oregon, Montana, Washington State, Maine, Florida, and Virginia. Price tag, $59,000. But not everybody buys that. Uh. I've, I've never traveled at public expense, and, and I don't intend to start doing that. Former Cincinnati Councilman Pat DeWine was just elected to the county commission in part by criticizing the travel habits of the incumbent. I think we have to cut back. DeWine says the only justifiable travel is for something you cannot get locally, especially in hard times. This is a tight budget year. Uh, employees haven't even got raises yet this year. We can't afford to be spending money on things that aren't uh, necessities. But there's a problem. Judges control their own travel. County commissioners cannot veto one specific trip or another. But there is one thing the commissioners can do, make less travel money available in the first place. You do plan to cut the judges' travel budget? I, pl I plan to cut travel budgets across the board. And with less money available, perhaps Hamilton County's traditionally conservative judges will be a little more conservative spending your money and won't be leaving the bench so often. Jeff Hirsch, Local 12. A spokesperson for the Commission on Continuing Education tells Local 12 that most Ohio judges stay right here in Ohio to fulfill their course requirements. A couple of final points. Two weeks ago, I incorrectly cited the cost implications for a $100,000 house in Lakota School District. The number I cited was one half the actual cost. This was entirely my fault. I simply looked at the wrong row of data while typing the information. I apologize. Last week, we focused on new voting systems. 
Robert and Joyce Rogers, who are blind, listen every week on the radio. In an email, Robert pointed out that the optical scan voting system insisted on by Secretary of State Ken Blackwell poses real problems for people who are visually impaired or do not have fine motor control in their hands to properly fill in bubbles on a printed page. The Rogers point out that Blackwell's decision flies in the face of the Federal Help Americans Vote Act, HAVA, which established the goal of creating voting systems that protect the ability of more than 34 million disabled Americans to a secret, independent, and verifiable vote. Mr. Rogers writes that a punch card in, with a punch card system, he and his wife have always had to depend on poll workers for help, and we're looking forward to the heart system, which is favored by the Hamilton County Board of Elections, which would have accommodated the blind. Thank you for making Local 12 Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Have a good week and join us again next week to, join, to hear the women and the men shaping our community for the future.